Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited to get started and to present to you our grocery store tour. So today our goal is going to be to navigate the grocery store with you, point out some key things, and really make sure your next grocery shopping experience is a good one. My name is Lindsay Moran, and I'm one of the registered dietitians here at Connect Care 3. And joining me today is Kate. Hi everyone, I'm another registered dietitian here and I'm so excited to join you on this tour today. Awesome, thank you, Kate. Mm -hmm. So today, our objectives are number one, to help you prepare for the store. Um, we're gonna work on, you know, going through your inventory in your house, you know, making sure you're creating a list or um, prepping so that your trip to the store is the most beneficial that it can be. Number two, we're gonna learn a little bit about how to read nutrition facts labels um, and to look for food packaging claims on your packaged foods. Um, again, to make sure you're choosing what's best for you and your nutrition needs. And last but not least, we're gonna go through each and every aisle um, to focus on some key nutrition um, takeaways from each, kind of focus on a few important foods um, and really hope to, you know, educate you on what you're looking at while you're in the store. So with that, I'm going to let Kate get started with preparing for the store. All right. So before we can be successful in the store, we really got to take the time to prepare. So we like to suggest start out by planning out your meals and snacks for the week. And if you're not a big planner, maybe even just having a couple snacks or meals in mind to get you started. And from here, you really want to take the time to form an ingredient list. This might mean taking stock of your current items that you have on hand and then creating a list of the new items that you need to get. There are so many grocery lists, apps, and resources out there now that really support you and guide you in making that list. Some examples might be the List Ease app or even List Maker, which often sorts your list by even the aisles to keep you organized as you go through the store. Another tip we like to suggest is really take the time to assess your shopping list for the five food groups. So that's your protein foods, your dairy, grains, fruits, and vegetable. Doing this ahead of time helps ensure that you're getting all of your nutrition. Another thing is keep in mind your budget. Check the store's websites. Many of them even have apps now that you can look at. You can look at the weekly ads or even cut coupons in the apps. I know Lindsay and I both like to take advantage of online shopping for our groceries at times, and this is sometimes a nice way, even if you're not gonna pick up, you can still maneuver the aisle online and even look at some of the nutrition labels ahead of time. Last but not least, we really suggest not shopping hungry. Take a snack with you on your way or just make sure you have an adequate meal as you go. All right, so as we get prepared to enter that store, let's start to visualize our cart. You may have heard of the MyPlate, and if you haven't, the MyPlate is a great tool which really balances out the five different food groups and showing you the portion on the plate. Well, here we're bringing you the new MyCart. So this is the MyPlate transformed into your cart. Similar to your MyPlate, you wanna use this to help guide your nutrition choices. It's an easy way to ensure nutrition, especially if you're feeling a time crunch or overwhelmed by labels or food packaging. You can see that the five food groups are also in our cart. So as you're going through those aisles at your next trip, really assess the cart. Am I getting fruits, vegetables, grains, proteins, and dairy? We're gonna touch on all of these topics today and, and give you some nutrition tips along the way. Awesome. <clears throat> so as you are navigating through the grocery store, you're also going to want to pay attention to your nutrition facts labels. These are really important. As you all know, we all have different nutrition needs, different, you know, um, medical histories, allergies, whatever the case may be, we all might be trying to look for something different and to get different things out of our food. So one way that we can really, you know, learn about what's in the food we're purchasing is by looking at the nutrition facts labels. They can be really important to understand. 
So we're going to take some time to just go through this briefly. Make sure you have a basic understanding of the label. To start off, we have the green section here. You'll notice in the green section is your serving size and your calories per serving. So what's really important to focus on, number one, is your serving size. For this particular food, we see that a serving size is one cup. So let's say that this food is a bag of pretzels, for example. If you were to eat just one cup of that bag, um, you would be getting the nutrition that is listed on this label. That being said, you see above that one cup serving that there are four servings per container. So what that means is if you were really hungry, you know, and had to eat that whole bag of pretzels, you'd have to multiply everything on this label by four to get the accurate, accurate nutrition information. Uh, <clears throat> below the serving size, you'll see the calories listed. And just a little information about calories. Calories are just a unit of energy. That's really what they measure. Um, so just something again to be aware of. We all have different calorie needs for each day. It, and they depend on our age, height, weight, again, our medical history, our physical activity level, um, our gender, so on and so forth. So everyone has that different calorie need. Moving further down the label, we see the red section. So this contains a lot of our macronutrients, such as our total fat, our carbohydrates, and also other nutrients like sodium and sugars. <clears throat> it's important to be mindful of these foods again as there are sorry it's important to be mindful of these nutrients as again they're all important um but they are also some that we want to make sure we're not consuming in excess so you'll learn a little bit more about this throughout the presentation but one thing for example is our saturated fat we want to try and make sure we're not consuming too much of that throughout the day um, and maybe if you're someone who is diabetic or really needs to focus on your carbohydrate intake, you know, that's another area you might need to be particularly mindful of. And again, these are just examples. Moving further down the label, we see our navy blue section here, and these are other nutrients to really strive for in your diet. We see number one, dietary fiber. Um, that's kind of snuck into that red section there because it un falls under our carbohydrate section. But most Americans are actually falling short of the recommended daily intake for dietary fiber, which is about 25 to 30 grams per day. So that's, you know, a nutrient that we really want to try to get enough of. And we get from our fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, beans, legumes, things like that. Next, we have our protein, which is, again, one of our macronutrients. That's really important. We want to make sure we're getting enough of that. Um, and last but not least, our vitamins and minerals, which are, of course, an essential part of um, our daily nutrition. Now, moving on to the right-hand side of the label, in the purple column here, you see the percent daily value. And I think this is a tool that or a, a, an area of the label that is really beneficial and underutilized because not many people understand, you know, what it means or how they can use it to their benefit. So there is a rule that we call the percent daily value five and 20 rule that can be really beneficial in helping to guide your food choices. So what that rule states is that if a food or, um, nutrient is listed as less than 5% of the daily value, we can assume that it is low in that particular nutrient. And if a food um, has a nutrient listed as greater than 20% of the daily value, we can then assume that in generally speaking, this is a good source of that particular nutrient. So let's talk about an example. Um, we see sodium listed here in that red section. It says there are 80 milligrams of sodium per serving. If we follow that to the right, we see that that's 3% of the daily value. So if we're using that 5 and 20 rule, 3% is less than 5. So we can assume that this food is, a, is low in sodium. It's a low sodium food. On the other hand, if we look a few rows down to dietary fiber, we see that it says there's 7 grams per serving. Follow that to the right. And that is said to be 25% of the daily value. So again, using that five and 20 rule, 
25% is greater than 20. So we can assume that this food is a good source of dietary fiber. Um, again, all of us have these different nutrition goals. Maybe you're someone who is trying to cut back on sodium. Maybe you're really trying to increase your um, fiber intake. Whatever the case may be, you can use this um, percent daily value tool to help guide your choices. So let's say the you know nutrition facts label might sound a, seem a little bit overwhelming, or you're looking for a quicker way to kind of um, choose your your groceries at the store. Our food packaging claims can be helpful for that. Um, the FDA has three categories of these food packaging claims. We have nutrient content claims, structure function claims, um, and health claims. So all these different categories, but at the end of the day, what they are are just quick ways to identify, you know, what the food you're purchasing kind of contains or, or you know, claims to contain. <clears throat> So a few examples, you see them listed here. You'll see low, free, reduced, or less, um, no added, or this is a good source of, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, just to kind of dive into a few of those a little deeper, we'll start with low. The claim low can be used on, again, many different food labels. Most commonly, you'll see things like low fat, which would mean three grams of fat or less per serving. You might also see low sodium, which means that there are 140 milligrams or less of per, per serving of sodium. Um, you might also see something that says low calorie, and a low calorie food is considered something with 40 calories or less per serving. You might also see something labeled as reduced or less, um, and these two terms are used to compare a particular product to another one. For example, if you have a reduced calorie product, that means that there are at least 25% less calories in that product than there are in the comparable like reg regular product. Um, same thing goes for reduced fat or reduced sugar. Again, there is at least 25% less sugar or fat than the regular product would have in these cases. And last but not least, we'll talk about no added. So you might, you know, be familiar with seeing claims that say no salt added, no sugar added, um, and, you know, similar claims to that. What's important to really understand here is this claim does not mean that there's no sodium or, or no sugar at all in the product. What it does mean is that during processing, no additional um, sodium or sugar, again, just using those as examples, was added. So if you are someone who's being really mindful of particular nutrients and you see that there's no added salt or no added sugar, it's still important to then refer back to the your nutrition facts label to see how much is still occurring in the food naturally, because there still could be some of that in there. <clears throat> so that kind of wraps up our you know, little um, information session on understanding food packaging claims and nutrition labels. I'm going to turn it back over to Kate now to begin the fun stuff. We'll get started now in our grocery store tour. Awesome. So now that you have your list made, you understand food labels, you know how to organize your cart, now we are ready to maneuver that grocery store. So today we're going to be going through the various aisles. Our first stop is fresh produce. I don't know about you, Lindsay, but this usually hits me right in the face when I walk into the store. That's right. Uh, I love the fresh produce aisle because of all the color and variety. As dietitians, we often talk about color equaling nutrition, and that's because many different colors equal different vitamins and minerals. For example, orange, you have beta carotene, blue and purple, you have phytochemicals. These are all so important, and we really encourage you to get a variety throughout your week. You know, sometimes I have clients t tell me, oh, it's too expensive to shop in the produce section. And so some tips that we might suggest is looking for a sale rack in your produce section. A lot of grocery stores have that now. It's usually produce that's kind of ready to be used right away. It's still in good condition, but it might be where you find those avocados that need to be mashed up you know, and guacamole that night or those peppers that maybe were sitting there for a couple of days, but would work perfectly, it cut up and put into a dish. 
Another thing to look for again, as I mentioned earlier, is those weekly ads. Sometimes you can find buy one, get one free blueberries, you know, and if you don't have a large family, this is a great time to freeze and store. So really just planning your produce strategically can help with budget. Another thing I often hear in the fresh produce aisle is it's too much work, you know, prepping and planning all of that produce. And sometimes I suggest let the store do the cutting for you. You know, there's lots of great selections now, like pre-cut vegetables and fruits, and these make for great options. I know we love to get those Brussels sprouts that are already off the stock and washed, and so we can just toss them in our favorite seasoning and get roasting. Another way to really ensure that you are, you know, getting the best bang for your buck, but also the best flavor is really shopping what's in season. Here we have for you just a nice summary of some different produce, although there's many, many more, but where they're kind of in season. So we really encourage you to shop local. A lot of produce sections even highlight the seasonal local produce. You may see it right when you walk in, look for signs like local or seasonal. Um, we're in the midst of summer right now, so you can see we highlighted. Um, you have your corns, blackberries, cucumbers, tomatoes. It's really a great way to be cost effective, but also to get your best taste and most nutrition. You know, we often hear or feel that clients maybe aren't getting all their fruits and vegetables in the week. So we want to take advantage of that taste. Another suggestion I like to make is really you can use this to help guide your meal planning too. If you're not sure, you know, what fruit to use that week or vegetable, you can really look at what's in season. So Lindsay, I do get a lot of questions about should I buy everything organic? What's your take on that? That's a great question, question, Kate, and definitely one that comes up a lot with my clients as well. And I'll start by saying that really I don't want the idea that you need to purchase something organically or regularly to deter you from consuming produce in general. You know, in general, all produce um, is considered safe according to the USDA, you know, that is found in the United States. Um, however, it's still important to wash all of your produce well. So I always recommend, regardless whether or not you're buying something organically or not, um, to wash all your produce well, make sure you're running it underwater, giving it a good scrub. And if you'd like to, you can also try using a, um, produce wash that can often be found in that produce section of your grocery store. So keep that in mind. Um, if by purchasing something organically is, you know, a concern of yours and something you'd really like to do, you can use the Dirty Dozen and Clean 15 list to help guide your purchases. So every year the Environmental Working Group um, comes up with these lists called the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. And they can be really interesting to look at. So they note that those on the dirty dozen list might contain elevated levels of pesticide, pesticides, while um, the Clean 15 serves as a list of foods that you can save some money on by not, you know, purchasing organic, as these are most likely to have low levels of pesticides. So again, I I'll be completely honest with you guys. I am for the most part don't buy much organic produce because I think that as long as it's washed and, you know, um, prepared safely, I'm comfortable with consuming that and I'd rather save the money so I can get all of my good produce in. But if I am going to be picky, I'll usually choose organic foods that are off of the dirty dozen list. You know, maybe I'll pick, you know, my organic strawberries and some organic celery, um, and then buy non-organic foods like avocado, broccoli, asparagus, things like that. So you can use these lists to really help guide your choices. But again, remember, at the end of the day, it's so important to be getting lots of fresh fruits, vegetables, all your good produce. So if you can, if buying organic is not in your means, it's okay. Just buy your regular produce, wash it well, and you should be just fine. And with that being said, we'll move on to the next section of the grocery store. We have our deli section. Um, and I know when the deli section can be overwhelming, there are so many different options available. It's usually crowded. You have to get your ticket. So who wants to be worried about, you know, what they're going to choose? Um, you know, the deli also is a popular place to get 
options like formed meats like salami, pressed ham, and bologna or pepperoni. And while these things might be really tasty, it's important to note that they are usually really high in sodium and saturated fat. So just a little information on these two nutrients. We have sodium that is um, some, somewhat important. We do need some sodium in our diets each and every day, but too much can be, uh, can cause negative health consequences, you know, especially if you're someone with hypertension or high blood pressure, too much sodium can exacerbate that. So we want to make sure we're limiting our sodium intake. Um, actually, most people in the country are, um, have an intake that's much greater than what's recommended for our daily sodium. So in general, most of you listening out there might have an opportunity to cut back on some of that sodium. Um, we also talked about saturated fat here. And again, while some saturated fat is okay, consuming too much or consuming it in excess can lead to things like high cholesterol levels or you know, increased risk for heart disease and things like that. So we wanna make sure we're being mindful of how much saturated fat we're consuming. Um, so at the deli can be one place to, you know, be making these mindful decisions. Some healthier options might be turkey breast or maybe chicken, roast beef, a leaner slice of ham, um, or again, looking for any variety that is listed as a reduced sodium variety. When we are at the deli, I also think of like pre-made salads a lot. We have things like chicken salad, tuna salad, pasta salad, you know, whatever the case may be, so many salads available. And a lot of times, again, these are higher in sodium and those saturated fats from those creamy dressings and things. Um, so to make a better choice, you might consider looking for a salad that is made with an oil instead of like a cream-based sauce. Um, or you can consider making, you know, a salad at home. Um, from there, I'd move on to maybe some better options to pick from the deli, which might be a rotisserie chicken. This can be really great to quickly chop up and throw in your own chicken salad or to, you know, use for a quick weeknight meal. You can use, you know, your leftovers for lunch the next day, even make it into a soup. You know, there are a lot of options with this convenient type of rotisserie chicken. Um, if your deli has a salad bar, there's oftentimes a lot of good choices there. You can make a nice fresh salad with your fruits, vegetables, um, and whatever else they have on hand. Um, other options available might be like something like pickled eggs. So don't hesitate to explore the deli for all it has to offer and just be mindful um, of the choices that you're making. That leads us to our next section. We're gonna round the corner into the meat and seafood department. Oh yeah, we're on the move today. So some similar takeaways to the deli, but maybe also some new considerations in our meat and seafood aisle. So our meat and seafood aisle are totally gonna give us some great protein options, but something we really wanna consider, similar to what Lindsay touched on, are those saturated fats. So we do need some in our diet, but saturated fats are really solid at room temperature. Oftentimes we think of that butter, but it's also that beautiful marbling we usually see in the meats is also saturated fat. So we really want to aim for some leaner protein options throughout the week. This might look like chicken, turkey, and even fish and shellfish. The American Heart Association actually recommends about two servings of seafood per week to really get those needed omega-3s. If you're not a big seafood person, there's other options such as nuts and seeds, but we really wanna try to get those fish servings in if we can. If you or someone in your family just really loves red meats, there's also some leaner options in this category. You have your flank steak, your London broil, and even some pork tenderloin. Another suggestion we often make is really looking for the fat percentage and the lean percentage on your meats. So a leaner cut might look like 93% lean and 7% fat. If you're someone that's really hesitant to cut too much flavor out with the fat, sometimes we recommend taking a half and half approach. This could look like maybe making meatballs with half ground turkey and half ground beef. So you're still getting that flavor and that um, common beef that you enjoy, but you're almost cutting it the fat in half by using the turkey. 
Another tip we often suggest is also consider how you're going to be cooking these meats. We can choose lower fat cooking methods such as roasting, baking, grilling, and sauteing, which use less oil, but also can allow that oil to drip or remove from the meat or fish. This is better than certain options such as frying or adding too much oil during cooking. So consider that through your section of meat and seafood. Now we're going to head over to our next stop, which is eggs and dairy. Awesome. <laughs> So when I, I don't know about you guys, but when I enter the dairy aisle, the first thing that comes to mind is milk. Um, and as you might be familiar with, there are just seems to be so many different options available these days in the milk department. Um, so when it comes to our regular, you know, cow's milk, <clears throat> we are usually going to recommend to choose low fat or fat free milk options. So that 1% or skim milk. And again, that's to kind of limit our intake of that saturated fat. Now, if you're someone who, you know, a lot of times clients say to me, Lindsay, I just love the taste of whole milk. I can't stand to think of using 1% or skim in my bowl of cereal in the morning. Um, and hey, that's okay. That's what's great about nutrition. There are so many different ways to, you know, meet your needs um, and nothing's black and white. So again, remember, as a whole, we're trying to cut back our saturated in, um, fat intake, but you're still going to get some throughout your day, and that's normal. Um, so maybe you really like that whole milk in the morning or whenever it is you might drink it. Um, that's fine. Maybe then you're going to choose much leaner options, you know, when you're in that meat and seafood department, or you're going to be really careful at the deli. You're going to, you know, cut back on that saturated fat in other areas of your diet, and that's okay. Um, if you're not a fan of cow's milk, or maybe you follow a vegetarian or vegan diet, or, you know, don't tolerate cow's milk very well, you can certainly choose some plant-based alternatives because boy, are there plenty to choose from. We have nut milks ranging from almond milk to cashew milk. Um, there are oat milks nowadays. Um, you can do soy milk. Really, the options are endless. Um, so, you know, I'd encourage you to do some exploring. Maybe the next time you go to the grocery store, try a new plant-based milk and see how you like it. If you're not a fan, you know, try next one the next week or, you know, take different, um, don't be afraid to really explore and try new things. Um, one thing to keep in mind about these plant-based alternatives is that the nutrient content is a lot different or a bit different than, you know, your traditional regular cow's milk. Um, one thing to recognize in particular is that they're usually going to be lower in protein. So just keep that in mind. When I'm in the dairy aisle as well, I'm always looking at yogurt options. Yogurt is such a great option for a nice healthy snack, um, even a component of a meal, like a nice yogurt parfait for breakfast. Um, and there are, again, a lot of options to choose for and to navigate. So, again, I would usually recommend a low fat or fat free yogurt option with little to no added sugar, if possible. Um, if you're looking for a yogurt option that's, you know, a lot higher in protein, maybe a little bit thicker and more creamy, you're going to want to look for a Greek yogurt like Chobani or Oikos. Um, or even an Icelandic yogurt, which is a little bit of a newer concept, or I shouldn't say newer, but one that's recently become more popular. Um, some of those brands are like Siggy's, um, which you might be familiar with. Um, those Greek yogurts, again, are, go are strained a little bit more, so they become thicker, a little more creamier, and are have a higher protein content. Now, if you're someone who really likes those flavored yogurts, um, we know they usually have a little bit more of that added sugar, so you might want to look for options like Oikos Triple Zero or Chobani Less Sugar, so you still get that flavoring, but not as much sugar in the product. Um, or what you can do is take your plain yogurt and sweeten it yourself. You know, add some fruit for some great natural sweetness and fiber. You can add some low sugar granola. Um, you might even drizzle a little bit of honey in there. Really, again, the options are endless, and I would always recommend, you know, sweetening your yogurt on your own um, over purchasing one that's already pre-flavored or sweetened. 
in the um, dairy aisle, we also come across cheese. Um, and it kind of, you know, you'll also find that in the deli. So we're going to think of the deli when we're talking about cheese as well. Um, again, and I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but you can look for some reduced fat options when possible. Um, so on the label there, you'll see like maybe a 2% reduced fat cheese or, you know, reduced fat provolone, whatever the case may be. Um, a, a really, you know, low fat or healthier option of cheese I always think of for a good snack or meal component is cottage cheese. You can mix a lot in there to flavor it how you'd prefer. But again, it's a really great source of dairy and protein. Cheese can also be higher in sodium, so be mindful of that. Um, and just a little tip is that Swiss cheese is generally the lowest sodium option. Now, cheese can definitely be a great snack option. Um, I oftentimes recommend things like reduced fat string cheese or those little baby bell cheeses. They pair really well with some whole grain crackers or a handful of nuts or maybe a piece of fruit, whatever you're, you know, interested in. And last but not least, on the dairy aisle, we have eggs. There's not too much to say about eggs, you know, kind of an, an egg is an egg. It's a great source of protein. Um, it's very versatile. We can, you know, scramble them up for breakfast, hard boil them and bring them for a snack or a component for lunch throughout the day. Um, but a really good option nonetheless. One question I do get a lot is, are brown eggs or white eggs better? You know, what should I choose? And really, they have no nutritional differences. Um, the color is just determined by the breed of hen that's producing that or that egg. So not to worry there. And with that, we're going to turn it back to Kate. Wow, Lindsay, your dairy ideas sound so yummy. All right, so now we're heading out from our refrigerated section. Let's hit the frozen food section. So I don't know about you, Lindsay, but I feel like frozen foods often get a bad rap. Well, we're here to kind of break that myth for you guys. Frozen foods are a great way to get nutrition in. First of all, they're budget friendly, so who doesn't love that? They last longer, so when you're preparing and planning, definitely incorporate um, frozen foods into your list. And they're just quick and convenient. Oftentimes, I'll even encourage people to use their fresh produce earlier in the week and then their frozen produce later in the week. So really get strategic with your meal planning, even if it's the same type of produce or use that as a time to get a variety, really stock up on these options. Transitioning to talking about frozen meals, this is where we can sometimes see that the nutrition can get a little out of whack. So there's just a couple things we want to keep in mind. Sometimes, because often these meals are really meant to last longer, they contain more sodium or more saturated fat. There's still many good options available though. So when we're looking for a frozen meal, try to think of those components that we talked about in the beginning with our food groups. We wanna look for a good energy source of carbs with some fiber, maybe a nice lean protein, and then even some veggies. If a meal that you're picking is missing that, this is a great time to get creative. Maybe if your meal has no good carbs in it, maybe you add some brown rice or extra frozen veggies to really bulk it up. A lot of times people tell me they feel frozen meals just aren't filling, and a lot of them can be pretty small. Also, use your nutrition labels. Especially for sodium, we want to kind of, if it's in place of a meal, look to keep it around 600 milligrams. A little more, a little less is okay. But if it's in place of a meal, that's a good recommendation. And if it's a snack, then we want to be even lower than that, maybe closer to 200 milligrams of sodium. Options are endless on how you want to use frozen foods. It might look like using frozen fruits, adding that in a smoothie or in those great yogurt parfaits Lindsay was talking about. You could top your cereal or some cottage cheese. We like to use them in baking, whether that's in muffins or maybe some blueberry pancakes. Another idea is to use some frozen veggies as well. You could mix them into your morning omelet or even create a quick stir fry for dinner. So don't avoid this aisle, but definitely you want to be using your food labels and even your ingredient lists. A couple brands too, just to help you out that we like to recommend are Evil which is love spelled backwards. This is a nice brand that really tries to keep that sodium in that 600 range. Smart Made is a good brand too. It really, you can recognize all the ingredients, which is nice. You know, you can see chicken and veggies and then healthy choice. There's many, many more, but we just wanted to give you a couple ideas to get you started. 
So speaking of convenience, let's chat about packaged foods a little bit. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'm sure many of you have heard, you know, the, the old myth, so to speak, that you should only be shopping the perimeter of the grocery store. There's nothing nutritionally valuable in the center aisles. And we're here to kind of bust that myth and tell you that you can certainly shop the center of the store. You know, some of our kitchen staples are located in these packaged food sections, and they're definitely not all bad. <clears throat> so we'll kind of go through some examples today to get you feeling a little more comfortable in these center aisles. One thing I think of, you know, in the packaged food section is our condiments. <clears throat> we see a lot of ketchups, mustards, barbecue sauces, marinades, hot sauce, whatever the case may be. And what can be something to keep an eye out on these items is, again, they can possibly be higher in sodium and added sugar. So we wanna be looking out for that. Now, there are a couple ways to manage these high sodium and sugar levels. Number one, we can be looking for the labels like we talked about earlier, looking for packaging claims that say no added salt or no added sugar, maybe low sodium, low sugar, um, or going straight to the label itself and kind of looking at that percent daily value to help guide your choices. On the other hand, if you're like, you know what, that low sugar, low sodium ketchup just doesn't do it for me, I, I don't enjoy it, um, you can purchase the regular one and just be really mindful of your portion sizes, how often you're using it. You know, maybe if you're someone who's throwing hot sauce on breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but also need to watch that sodium intake, you know, that might be something to reconsider. Hey, I need to find a lower sodium option or I need to cut back on my, you know, serving size or how often I'm using this um, condiment. Um, what you can do when it comes to your condiments too is, again, just use them sparingly. Um, you oftentimes need less than you think. So start small. And, you know, if you really do need more, then you can slowly add and build upon that. So moving on from condiments, I like to talk a lot about herbs and spices because who likes to eat bland food, right? We always are trying to flavor it, spice it up, make it taste better. Um, but again, it can be really easy to get different blends that might sound like they, they're gonna taste really good, but can be really high in sodium. So it's something we wanna be mindful of. If you're someone who does enjoy a good seasoning blend but wanna watch your sodium intake, look for different brands that you know have low or no sodium. One that we really like is Mrs. Dash. Um, they have a lot of great different seasoning blends that have no salt in them. So again, you're getting a lot of that extra flavor, that seasoning, but not worried about the sodium content. You can also feel free to, you know, be creative, use a variety of your own different um, herbs and spices to flavor your food. You might wanna pick up a pen and pencil. I'll give you some example, or a pen and pencil. You might wanna pick up a pen and paper right now. I'll give you some examples of some sodium-free flavoring tips for different foods. And if you don't have anything available, you know, we are recording this, so you can listen to it at a different time. And we'd be happy to also share with you, you know, at the end. So if you're seasoning chicken, you can try basil, cloves, nutmeg, oregano, or thyme. If you're seasoning fish, you might try bay leaf, dry mustard, paprika, or turmeric. Um, and if you're seasoning eggs, you know, try onion powder, rosemary, paprika, or dill. Um, you can also make your own blend. We talked about those blends earlier. Um, one you might try on your own consists of the following. Again, get those pens ready. We have five teaspoons of onion powder, two and a half teaspoons of garlic, two and a half teaspoons of paprika, two and a half teaspoons of dried mustard, one and a half teaspoons of crushed thyme leaves, a half teaspoon white pepper, and a quarter teaspoon of celery seed. So mix that all up. Throw it on your favorite veggies, your chicken, whatever it is you're seasoning for a really tasty um, way to spice up your dish. 
So moving on in the packaged food section, we come to my favorite topic, which is snacks. You ask anyone at our office here, and I, I have a drawer full of snacks because they're really important. You know, between meals, we oftentimes, you know, need something extra to keep us fueled, to keep our brains working optimally, or so we're thinking good at work. Um, and snacks are a really great way to do that. Now, of course, there are some really poor choices out there or options available for snacks, but there are also some, some really nutritionally dense, healthy options for our snacks. So again, we wanna be looking at our food labels, our food packaging claims, looking for options that are lower in added sugar and salt, because again, those are the two things that are usually gonna get you when it comes to the snack foods. Um, things you should be looking for as well are snacks that are higher in fiber with a good source of protein or some healthy fats, which will really help to keep you feeling full and satisfied until that next meal time comes around. So now I'll just go through some examples when it comes to choosing a um, healthy snack. You know, you might try unbuttered popcorn like Skinny Pop, Boom Chicka Pop, or Popcorners, Popcorn Chips. And you can pair that with some sliced fruit for a nice snack. You might try whole grain crackers like Triscuits, Good Thins, Nut Thins, or Mary's Gone Crackers for some great whole grain, high fiber options. And pair that with maybe some low fat cheese, that Baby Bell or, or String Cheese that we talked about earlier. If you're someone who really likes that crunch of some chips, you can try some healthier alternatives like from the ground up cauliflower tortilla chips, Ritz crisp and thins, pop chips, or my personal favorite, which are food should taste good multigrain chips. You know, dip these in a fresh salsa, guacamole, or hummus, um, or another bean dip for a really healthy, well balanced snack. In the packaged food aisle, you'll also find things like peanut butter, which again can pair well with fruits or veggies. You might also go for unsalted nuts or seeds, again, for that good fiber, protein, some healthy fats. Um, you can, you can mix those together with dried fruit um, to make a nice trail mix. Last but not least, you might find granola or protein bars in the snack aisle that can be really great for an on-the-go snack or even a meal in some cases if it's higher enough in calories. Um, and some tips for picking a, a good snack granola or protein bar would be to look for one with more than three grams of dietary fiber, less than seven grams of added sugar, and less than 10 grams of fat. And we wanna be looking for some heart healthy sources of fat here. So be mindful of that as well. And with that, we come to canned foods. Yes, so as you continue down your center aisle, it's pretty popular to shop and stop in the canned food section. Canned foods are great for just last minute dinners, convenience, everyday meal planning, but also to keep on hand and be prepared. You know, you never know what can happen. They're also really affordable, so I like them for that reason as well. You know, a couple things we like to keep in mind in the canned foods aisle is items that might be higher in sodium or even added sugar. So for example, you may see canned vegetables or beans that are filled with salt. So what you could do is use those packaging claims like Lindsay talked about and look for no added salt or lower reduced sodium. Or we often recommend even just draining them, rinsing off that excess salt. Additionally, like fruits, fruits often can be stored in heavy syrups, which contain a lot of added sugar. We don't really necessarily need this to add to the flavor, so we could really look for canned fruits in their own juices or even in water. There are great affordable lean protein sources in the canned aisle as well. I know my favorite thing to get is the canned beans. I often like to throw together a quick lunch, which includes canned chickpeas, canned tomatoes, a chopped cucumber and mix in some feta and Greek dressing and you have yourself a yummy and quick Greek salad. You can also find canned fish and meat here. So this might be like tuna or salmon in cans or even pouches. You have the bumblebee brand, the star kissed. I know we're a big fan of those pouches because you can just rip them open and dip in your favorite cracker or put it on some bread or even use some veggies. 
as you continue to maneuver this canned food aisle, you'll probably come across soups. So we often get asked about soups because many people do enjoy, you know, the comfort of soup and the taste. So outside of making your own, there's definitely some brands to look for here. We suggest Health Valley canned soup. Amy makes a great brand. Um, Amy's soups, which use really whole ingredients. And then Well Yes is a good brand. They have nice chunky soups, but they also have sipping soups that are pureed without the chunks. Another thing to keep in mind when shopping in the canned food section is your sauce. So, you know, we use sauce for so many things, I feel like, which isn't a bad thing. It really adds to that flavor and elevates a dish. But like we talked earlier, this can be an area where we're adding a lot of excess things if we're not careful. Some brands that we found that we like is Rinaldi's No Salt Added Sauce. They use a lot of other spices. My personal favorite is Alessio's Spaghetti Sauce, very low in the salt. And again, those addition of oregano and basil, which gives you flavor in other ways. If you're not quite sold on no salt in your sauce, or you're just worried about implementing that, again, take that half and half approach. Maybe you have one can that's light in the salt and one without, and you mix them together in your dish. Here we'll also see our dressings. There are so many options that can be overwhelming. We talked a lot today about saturated fat, but we didn't quite talk yet about those healthy fats. So oils and unsaturated fats are really heart healthy. So if possible, depending on the situation, we want to try to choose dressings that are more of those olive oil or even vinegar or water based. A couple brands we suggest are Bolt House or Opa. These are actually made with yogurt, so very creative and even gives you a little protein there. Um, there's even packets out there. One's called Good Seasons, which is an Italian dressing mix where you can add the seasoning packet into your own choice of oil, vinegar, and you can dilute it as you prefer. So this is nice because you are in control of what you add. Another option is to make your own dressing. I think, you know, exploring that can sometimes be fun and, and a lot of these products we have on hand. So one example, get those pens ready again, might be using three tablespoons of olive oil, one garlic clove or half a teaspoon of garlic powder, a tablespoon of lemon juice or red wine vinegar, you can do either to get that tang, and then one teaspoon of Dijon mustard. All right, so approaching the end of our aisles here, you'll usually come out upon your bread and bakery aisle, and boy, doesn't that aisle smell so good. There's so many options in the bread aisle. Sometimes it can be a little overwhelming, Something, if you're really trying to consider your most nutrition, we really recommend going for that 100% whole wheat or whole grain. If you're unsure, because it can be confusing, if your bread meets that criteria, there's three different ways you can really tell. One is looking for that 100% whole grain stamp, as you can see here on this slide. Another option is that the bread itself should say 100% whole wheat. Now, don't get confused with multigrain or even just the word wheat or honey wheat. This may not necessarily be 100% whole grain. And lastly, we can also look in that ingredient list, which will be found under our nutrition label. And we want our first words to be whole wheat. Maybe you're not a fan of whole wheat bread or maybe someone in your family just doesn't eat it. We still want to recommend to aim for getting three grams of fiber in your bread if possible. So you may get fiber through other things like oats and seeds on top of your bread or even just a multi-grain mix where you have some white flour and also some wheat flour in your bread. Carbs just get a bad rap these days, but we really support you know good carb sources, full of fiber, they give you energy. So don't miss out on this aisle. There's lots of options like tortillas, bread thins, bread rounds, and then even just a nice simple loaf of bread. So clients ask me all the time what the difference is between whole wheat and white bread. So Kate, would you be able to go into that a little bit more in depth? Yes, that's a great question. The word wheat itself can be very between so here we just have a little diagram to show you the depth. Picked it 
really start out as what outer shell which I fiber, really bran flakes. That's this outer shell of wheat. We also have a germ here. So the germ is in the center of our wheat. It really provides us with various minerals and like B vitamins, things like that. And then in the middle, you have your endosperm, which is that fluffy white part of the bread. That's what makes that white bread so tasty and fluffy. So what they do is during processing, they to make refined or white grain, they remove this bran and they remove this germ. So really that's where the bulk of our nutrition is. And so we want to be cautious not to do this too often. Current recommendations really are to make half your grains whole wheat. So again, take a half approach if you're not sure if you want to go all in. Maybe your family doesn't enjoy whole wheat pasta. So maybe you try to get your whole wheat through cereals or crackers or even brown rice. The options are really endless. So we are wrapping up our tour today, but we are so excited you could join us. Yeah, thank you, Kate. It's been such a great time going through the grocery store with you all. Um, and just to highlight those key points again that we talk, uh, talked about today. Um, remember, make a grocery list and plan your next trip to the store using everything that you learned today. Making sure you have a plan can make your trip um, much more uh, productive and you can make sure you get what you want and need. Next, again, be sure to fill your cart with all the food groups. Get a good variety so that you're meeting all your nutritional needs. Be mindful of those food labels and food packaging claims. Now that you've learned how to read them and what they mean, you can really put that to use in your next trip to the grocery store. <laughs> next, be sure to find that nutrition in every aisle. Believe us, it's there. <laughs> and last but not least, consider reaching out to Connect Care 3 if you have any additional needs, questions, you know, want some individualized grocery store help, we're here to help you. <clears throat> and on that note, um, again, just remember that the Connect Care 3 services are available to you if you are on your employer's health plan. And with that, we'll leave you with our contact information. And thank you so much again for joining us today. Hope you have a great day.